Sakim, we're live. Okay, live stream is up. Will the sergeants begin your recordings? Recording to the computer. All right. Back, Recording. back up is rolling. Thank you. Now, uh, Sergeant Lugo, you may begin with the opening. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Ayala, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Diana Ayala, and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I would like to welcome you to our oversight hearing on employment agencies and other labor um, placement businesses. I am joined, joined today by my colleagues on the committee, Council Members Koslowitz, Ku, Kalos, Chen, and Lander. Labor placement businesses connect New, York's, uh, New Yorkers seeking employment opportunities with employees, employers in need of workers. Some of the most common types of these labor businesses include employment agencies and temp agencies. Employing, employment agencies generally find employment for job seekers for a fee, while temp agencies typically assign their own employees to work at job sites on a temporary or contract business um, basis. In New York State, temp agencies assign over 150,000 people to jobs on a temporary or contract basis each week and employ over 775,000 people. Temp agencies have expanded in recent years, and another similar model has sprung up. Labor brokers also employ workers and assume many employment related responsibilities, but they often recruit unskilled workers to perform manual labor for other companies. The labor broker model has become common in garment manufacturing, agriculture, and janitorial work. Labor brokers also become common in the construction industry where brokers sometimes referred to as body shops supply workers to real, real estate developers. The oversight, this oversight hearing we will be holding today will look into a number of issues and concerns that have been raised by advocates about exploitation and abuse of workers through various workforce models, especially the labor brokers. Labor brokers like body shops target vulnerable city populations. Body shops rely on labor of justice affected workers, whether recently released from prison on parole or with a criminal record. Justice affected city residents typically have a difficult time finding steady employment and some parolees may require employment as a condition of their parole. New York City's multi-billion dollar real estate development industry relies on the exploited labor of these formerly incarcerated individuals. Undocumented city residents and guest workers who may lack documentation and deal with language access barrier are also vulnerable to exploitation by uh, labor brokers. Although the labor broker model cuts across industries and salary brackets, it is predominantly people of color who are most negatively impacted. While there are a number of issues surrounding the practices of these labor brokers that agency groups have raised, I would like to briefly touch on issues surrounding pay equity, the health and safety of the workers, and a lack of accountability for labor broker firms. Underpayment is a common occurrence for, these employed, uh, for those employed by the labor brokers. In the city, workers employed through the labor brokering uh, process report an hourly rate of around $15 an hour, while the labor broker is paid around $40 an hour for supplying those laborers. The developer is still making a good deal. If they had used union workers, they would have to pay close to $70 per hour plus benefits. There have also been numerous reported stories of laborers working on unsafe conditions. The cleaning company, LN Pro Services, won a contract with the MTA to clean the subway systems during the pandemic. The workers, many of whom were immigrants, were undocumented, reported that they were not given adequate protective equipment, were given dirty cleaning supplies, and were paid under the, prom the promise, uh, under the promise $20 an hour. Female employees of labor brokers have faced sexual harassment on the job. The labor broker trade, uh, trade off, a body shop that predominantly employs formerly incarcerated individuals, settled a sexual harassment suit in New York City uh, with, the, with the New York City Attorney General after the Attorney General's investigation substantiated claims of severe 
sexual harassment and related uh, retaliation against 18 women, a majority of whom were women of color. A major concern that I have, given that these industries target vulnerable populations, is the lack of accountability that allows for these practices to continue. Although, as mentioned, the AG has prosecuted some of the most egregious behavior of body shops, but broader accountability has been more difficult. Labor uh, brokers have been known to dissolve and reestablish their business under new operating name and under the name of a family member to avoid scrutiny. Furthermore, as the National Employment Law um, Project has reported, the distance from the traditional employer-employee relationship may allow a contracting company to avoid minimum wage, overtime, and other legal responsibilities applicable to employee employers by characterizing the labor broker as the sole employer. The purpose of this oversight hearing today is to learn about those issues and understand the steps that this, commi this committee um, must take to ensure that those model work-based exploitation cease in the city. I am ready to legislate and I look forward to a conversation with the administration today about how we can work together on this issue. I'd now like to turn it over to the committee council to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. I am Stephanie Jones, Council to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panels to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. For all panelists, when called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Laura Lysalas, Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. We will also be joined for questions by the following representatives from DCWP. Stephen Etanani, Executive Director of External Affairs. Carlos Ortiz, Director of Legislative Affairs. Tamala Boyd, General Counsel, and Adam Blumenkrantz, Associate General Counsel. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Administration panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Salas? I do. Thank you. Executive Director Atanani? I do. Thank you. Director Ortiz? I do. Thanks. General Counsel Boyd? I do. Thank you. Associate General Counsel Blumenkrantz? I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite, invite Commissioner Salas to present her testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Ayala and members of the committee. Um, I'm Laurel Salas, Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, or DCWP. I am joined today by my colleagues, Tamala Boyd, General Counsel, Adam Blumenkrantz, our Associate General Counsel, Steve Etanani, Executive Director of External Affairs, and Carlos Ortiz, our Director of Legislative Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today before the committee. Presently, DCWP licenses more than 59,000 businesses and individuals in more than 50 industries. We enforce essential consumer protection, licensing, and workplace laws that serve countless New Yorkers and offer programming that increases access in our city to high quality financial services for New Yorkers. DCWP is designated under Article 11 of the New York State General Business Law as the licensing and enforcement agency for employment agencies in New York City. Employment agency laws and rules apply to businesses that, for a fee, help individuals find work or assist businesses in finding individuals to hire. There are approximately 240 licensed employment agencies in the city. Regulations governing employment agencies include 
requirements to post certain consumer disclosures, obligations to provide clients with contracts and receipts, and prohibitions from guaranteeing clients jobs, discriminating against a client on the basis of their age, race, or creed, or from charging illegal fees, such as for deposits or in advance of a job placement. DCWP takes its obligation under G GBL seriously, and the work begins with fostering a cultural compliance among licensees. DCWP voluntarily provides employment agencies, just as we would licensees governed by local law, a plain language inspection checklist. This checklist outlines um, the legal requirements uh, these agencies are subject to, and is a tool to help businesses or consumers identify and avoid violations before an inspection. The checklist is available on our website and is distributed by staff on educational business corridor walks. Under DCWP's Visiting Inspector Program, new brick and mortar employment agencies that open in the city also receive a scheduled personal educational visit from a seasoned inspector to go over any questions ownership and their staff may have about their obligations. New York State Employment Agency law is nuanced with, for example, differing licensee obligations uh, to clients depending on employment class and even a unique regulatory framework for theatrical employment agencies. DCWP voluntarily designs and makes available on its website templates for contracts, receipts, registers, and terms of conditions that licensees can use and feel confident in being compliant with the law. These templates are user-friendly, downloadable, and in some cases offered in multiple languages. Partnerships with stakeholders inform our compliance and education efforts. Most recently, DCWP partnered with the Association for Talent Agencies, ATA, to create a unique plain language checklist for their industry. This document is a product of a long-standing dialogue with the ATA to ensure that their membership is informed about their obligations and recent amendments to the GBL that impacted their constituency. DCWP has actively lobbied the state legislature to modernize employment agency protections for consumers. In 2015, DCWP provided complaint data to New York State Senators and Assembly members involved in the Justice for Job Seekers campaign. That data informed investigative reporting and eventually manifested into reforms adopted by Governor Cuomo. DCWP commended the state legislature for prohibiting advanced fees and instituting stricter terms and conditions disclosures for consumers. Mayor de Blasio wrote uh, the governor in October 2016, urging him to sign the measure into law, which the governor did. The 2016 reforms also allowed DCWP to require employment agencies to post the Job Hunters Bill of Rights, which DCWP developed with New Immigrant Community Empowerment, or NICE, as a useful resource for consumers. Prior to this 2016 reform, DCWP can mandate this important document be posted at an employment agency only after it was found to be in violation of the law, and even then only pursuant to a consent order with the employment agency. Concurrently with these recent amendments, DCWP engaged in continued outreach to communities on consumer protections for job seekers. This included developing consumer protection tips in over 10 languages. Since 2018, DCWP has conducted nearly 400 events educating New Yorkers on this topic, understanding the outsized impact of this fraud on immigrant New Yorkers. DCWP also partner with stakeholders that work with immigrant communities like Adikar, Chaya CDC, and the Arab American Association of New York to host a series of events discussing issues of fraud and job seeker protections. DCWP enforces employment agency laws and rules through mediation, field inspections, on patrol, or in response to complaints and actions brought by the agency before the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, both. 
In the past three years, we have received nearly 675 complaints, conducted 256 inspections, and issued 299 charges for violations of the employment agency laws and rules. However, despite our enforcement efforts, we continue to face uphill challenges with so-called fly-by-night employment agencies. These agencies lure consumers in, rip them off, and disappear shortly uh, thereafter. Typically, these unlicensed individuals or businesses sign short-term leases, use fake corporate names, or conduct outreach through informal networks that make locating them after a complaint extremely difficult. In ideal circumstances, a criminal enforcement entity with tools at its disposal, such as search warrants and wiretaps, would be better suited to capture the needed information to apprehend these individuals. Generally, though, DCWP may collaborate with appropriate enforcement agencies at the city, state, and federal level in a number of ways, including direct communications or through broader coalitions such as the Protecting Immigrant New Yorkers Task Force or the Queensboro President Immigration Task Force. As an example of this work, we have aided active investigations from the New York State Attorney General's Office by supplying additional complaints, affidavits, and even testimony from consumers that were harmed by deceptive practices. Regarding our own active cases, we expect to soon receive a decision from oath on a theatrical employment agency that has been operating without a license. The initial complaints were brought to us by several musical artists and were seeking civil penalties for the businesses, uh, the business unlicensed conduct. We hope that a successful outcome will help deter future violations by other businesses of the responsibilities and protect consumer rights in our city. Especially in times of crisis, such as, as we find ourselves today, it is imperative that our businesses, our consumers, and our communities in general understand that we must support each other. We cannot accept as a matter of course, harm to our most vulnerable fellow New Yorkers. At DCWP, we continue to work on ensuring that our consumers and workers have a voice within city government, a resource for education, and a shield from harmful business practices. In that work, we have always counted on and greatly appreciated the support of advocates and the city council. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now turn over questions from the chair. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Ayala? Thank you, and I also want to recognize that we've been joined by Council Members Brennan, Yeager, and Menchaca. Um, I have a lot of questions, but since this since this was part of the latter part of your testimony, um, I, I, while it's still fresh in my mind, I wonder, these fly-by-night uh, organizations, I get that it's very difficult to, to keep tabs on them, right, because they're coming and going and um, is, there, is there a mechanism? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that they're marketing themselves uh, via newspapers or how, how are people, how would, how would I, right, as a job seeking um, individual know that they exist, right? How would I be redirected to them? And is that something that, that, that uh, your organization has, your agency has the, the power, right? Or the, the, the manpower to really have oversight over, like, are you paying attention to that? Like, are you, are you screening for, you know, these, these level, these types of advertisements to see who's out there, what's, what the market looks like? Um, yes, thank you. That is a, that is a really important question, Chair Ayala. Um, you know, in the last year, especially, right, during the pandemic, I think anecdotally, I can tell you, we've been hearing a lot of um, consumers who hear about these agencies via very informal channels like WhatsApp or some online advertisements, right? Um, we, what we typically uh, try to educate consumers on is how important it is to seek the services of a licensed employment agency, right? A license, uh, an agency that's properly licensed will uh, show up if you do a search on our website uh, by their name, you'll be able to see that they are actually, um, that they have the appropriate license to operate. Um, and we try to always uh, remind consumers that in those cases, uh, we're better able to enforce the law and make sure that that agency is complying with all of the laws and rules that they're subject to. 
Now, um, we do not have, you know, as you know, I've testified before your uh, committee before, we have about 40 inspectors in the field um, that enforce for the 50 different categories of licenses that we have. Now, in the past, um, I think uh, we were, when we were patrolling um, and doing inspections in the field, we may sometimes have been able to like look into them, right? Like walked into a license um, or an employment agency and make sure that they're complying with all of the laws and rules. But more often we're hearing that um, a lot of those um, companies or business entities are operating more informally from either the back of a retail location that has different services being provided there, sometimes even from a, a residence, a personal residence, right? And so um, even when we get complaints about a potential agency that may not be licensed or may be conducting illegal activities or just failing to comply with the law, I can tell you that about almost half of the situations in which we send an inspector out, they do not find the location. The business already disappeared or um, it, they, they had an address that was not um, a real address, right? So um, it is a very challenging industry. Um, we do try to spend a lot more time doing education and outreach, uh, especially in our immigrant communities and what organizations that serve immigrants. Um, because sometimes to actually try to get um, appropriate remedies and resolutions from these entities is more complicated, um, especially if they do not have a brick and mortar location, right? Those are businesses that we can find, identify, sit down with them, right? Like give them all the tools they need to comply with the laws. So we do spend a lot of time um, talking to consumers about how to protect themselves and why it's so important, again, that they use the services of a licensed agency. Um, so um, that's what I can tell you. Um, I, I do not think that we spend, um, that we have the staffing to be always looking for um, what is happening on social media or other informal channels. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I mean, 50 industries seems like a lot, but I'm assuming that some of those industries are a little bit more problematic than others, right? And so I, I would wonder, right, how, how do you break up the the, the how do you divide the 40 inspectors in a way that adequately staffs, right? Um, where you have the highest needs, the industries that require a little bit more uh, attention um, and oversight. So uh, Commissioner, what, what does, the, what does the, the consumer education um, that you've referenced look like? Are you, are you working with, you know, specifically because so many of these individuals have, you know, have been impacted by, you know, by the justice system, um, are they, are you working with maybe, you know, uh, the division of parole um, or, you know, immigrant based groups that are, you know, that, that, that are in communication also, right, that have deep ties to, to this community so that, you know, people are as informed as possible, because I, I think, you know, going, I, like, I don't usually refer to a website unless like something happened, right, because that's kind of, you know, we, we want to be proactive and not mm -hmm. reactionary in this, in this case. Um, so if you could share a little bit about what that, that worker education looks like. Yeah, so specifically with respect to maybe workers that were formerly incarcerated, right? We certainly collaborate with other city agencies such as the Department of Probation um, and uh, the Department of um, DYCD Youth and Community Development. Um, but we also have worked with the Fortune Society, with the Abraham House, uh, the Urban Justice Center and CUNY to target uh, some of our outreach and education to the people that they serve, right? So that's in addition to the typical outreach that we've done in other more like, um, uh, I would say um, where the audience is more like, were more like immigrants or individuals with limited English profici proficiency. So we have partner, we do uh, understand how important it is that we have a presence in our communities and we provide this information into as many languages as possible. Um, so, you know, some of the issues that you described um, in, in your introduction, again, like they are not, you know, they're not always unique to employment agencies they are also pertaining to body shops and labor brokers, right? And other laws may be in place. But with respect to employment agencies, we have actually dedicated materials um, that we've published that are available in up to 10 languages. And those are distributed widely. They're consumer protections for uh, individuals who are job seekers, right? 
uh, and it tells you what are the things that you need to know once you walk into an employment agency. It tells you that you you must you know you you need to be asking for copies of uh, receipts and contracts and make sure that you're not paying any fees in advance of getting placed in a job. Right. Though again, those materials are translated into different languages, and we've conducted days of actions together with the Office of um, New Americans, for instance, um, ONA, and to to spread the word about uh, these important protections and, and how to, if, if for some reason you are actually the, the victim of, of fraud by one of these agencies, how to contact us. Do you know, uh, can you tell us how many of the 40 inspectors um, are assigned uh, direct um, oversight over this, this specific industry? So we, mm -hmm, yes, no, we do not have any inspectors assigned specifically to employment agency complaints, right? Um, our inspectors either respond to complaints or sometimes do patrol inspections, but they're not, um, we don't have a team that is dedicated to this work. Do we know what the number of complaints is annually? Um, so yes, we do have a breakdown. Um, I know that in the last, uh, since 2018, we've had 700 complaints um, and the complaints have been decreasing year after year. Um, I'm, I'm just looking on my notes for that. Um, and I don't know if anyone in my team has it handy for last year, what's the number of complaints? Do you think that the, that the number of complaints, that the reduction for last year may have been related to the, to the, the COVID uh, pandemic and the fact that you know, many of these work sites were shut down? Yes, um, I think that's exactly right, uh, Chair Ayala. We did see, um, and you know from my testimony at previous hearings, a majority of the complaints that we were getting were related to price gouging and other business reopening issues, right? Um, but I also have to say anecdotally, uh, last year I gave a lot of uh, interviews to ethnic media talking about the resurgence of, of these like online virtual um, agencies or job placement companies, right? Uh, as you know, m most of us moved to, to do business virtually and, and a lot of workers were actually trying to access services of companies online. So we spent a lot of time trying to inform consumers about how to protect themselves when they were um, looking to get the services from an online business. So just to just for the yearly breakdown for for complaints. So in 2018, the number was 258, 2019, 229, and then uh, 2020, 187. Um, so the so there is a decrease there, but also a decrease that predates COVID. Um, and I think a, a little bit of what the commissioner has been alluding to. Um, and it actually corresponds with a decrease in just licenses for employment agencies citywide over the past several years, is that the nature of this business has changed over time. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the, the tools that a civil enforcement agency like DCWP would have isn't, are not necessarily regardless of resources or how many, for example, theoretically inspectors we would uh, dedicate to, to a specific license category like this, wouldn't necessarily result in any tangible difference in kind of uh, enforcement or, or, or resolutions to cases, just because the nature of, of the issues at hand uh, tend to um, lend themselves to kind of informal networks where, where, where folks are kind of getting ripped off that would uh, again, preclude a civil enforcement agency that isn't able to like wiretap or, or search residential apartments that may be operating as employment agencies, uh, for example. We don't have those abilities and it kind of lends itself uh, to work that's outside of our, our scope. All right, I think, so we, we, you know, we discussed the different agencies that kind of fall on the, you know, the different models. What, what role does DCWP uh, have in terms of, you know, oversight um, uh, of, of these different, you know, employment models? To, for employment agencies, right, it's clearly we license them in New York City, right, and we do enforce um, 
those the laws that are applicable to them. If we're talking about temporary uh, employment agencies, right? You mentioned those and you also mentioned body shops and labor brokers. Well, temporary agencies are, um, again, they are also employers, right? They are employers un under the law. And so the laws that we will um, enforce in that industry would be laws like paid sick leave, for instance, a municipal workplace law, right? That is the kind of issue that for which we have jurisdiction to enforce. Um, these temporary employment agencies and body shops, as we understand the issues um, around uh, maybe wage theft or discrimination, those are um, laws, uh, oftentimes state and federal laws that are not within our purview. And so in some cases, if we get a complaint, let's say of an employment, uh, a temporary uh, employment agency, um, that uh, ha presents both, let's say, paid sick leave issues and maybe wage theft issues. We will investigate the issues that we can, like paid sick leave, and we will be referring out the wage theft issue to a state enforcement agency. Um, there are cases in which we've worked together with the Attorney General's offices and, and pursued um, maybe violations by a particular employer, like in the home care industry, and we've both um, litigated against these businesses together. But again, there are municipal workplace laws for which we have jurisdiction and we enforce those laws. And there are other issues that are uh, fall within the purview of state and federal uh, enforcement agencies. One, one of my questions was, you know, using the city's labor laws, right? Um, and the department's new focus, what can be done to help these workers? Would you say that those laws that you're referencing then like, is, is are the municipal laws helpful? And that's, are you attributing some of the reduction in complaints to those new practices, new um, policies? So, um, so if I understand your question well, um, we can, like, if we got a complaint, right, about a worker employed at a body shop and it's about paid sick leave, that is certainly a complaint that we we'll, would be able to look into and enforce, right? Um, but I guess what I'm saying is that there are other issues that uh, these workforces are alleging uh, they're experiencing uh, issues like retaliation uh, and, and uh, failure to get minimum and overtime wages and discrimination. And some of those issues are, um, the protections are under state and federal laws. And so while we would not be able to investigate them, when workers come to us with those complaints, we do our best to make sure that they know which agency they have to go to for those, um, to address those violations. Um, and the role that we've played uh, generally has been to do a lot of outreach and education. Like in our materials that are uh, our Bill of Rights for Workers, for instance, translated into many languages, cover not just the municipal work, workplace laws, but also some of the basic rights that workers have in the workplace, like state and federal minimum wage, and um, and um, and how to you know um, how to reach out to those agencies that have that jurisdiction. Okay. Now, do you uh, do you have any understanding of why employment agencies have been licensed under the New York State law, but temporary agencies and labor brokers have not? So uh, the main distinction, distinction, as I understand that, right? So the employment agencies' laws are uh, basically um, helping job seekers obtain employment, right? They refer them to employment opportunities, right? And they can charge a fee for that but they do not have, there's no continuity of our relationship there, right? And then when we're talking about temp agencies or labor brokers, they're actually the employers of these workers where they hire them, they uh, control the conditions of employment, they often are the ones who are paying them, whether it's cash or, or by check, they're still the ones responsible for paying the workers, issuing W-2s. Therefore, they are subject to your labor laws under city, state, and federal law, right? So there are laws that are in place that protect these workers. The question is, um, you know, are there enough resources invested in the enforcement or the workers, these workers understand that they're protected by these laws, right? Um, I think that is, that is a role that we actually have played and can continue to play in making sure that workers who are in New York City who are working for temp agencies or labor bro brokers understand that they, are, they have the protection of these important laws and that um, and there are um, certainly a number of strong anti-retaliation protections 
in many of these laws. Um, and again, some workers just are not aware of that. And I think we can always do a better role at educating them. Okay. Um, so we have, we, we have heard that other jurisdictions license uh, labor brokers. Do you think that that could be a useful oversight uh, mechanism for the uh, DCWP? So I have not looked at um, other licensing models um, and I would be happy to learn more about that and the experience of those localities licensing these types of um, businesses. Um, uh, again, I think for us, we, we don't, even though we're a licensing agency, we don't necessarily see licensing as always the best solution for every problem, uh, but we'd be happy to look at other models and examine them and see whether that's something that's workable in the city. Um, you know, it's, um, it, 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 yes, I, I don't know enough about how it has worked in other localities. Okay, so I have one more question and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, council members. And I also want to acknowledge that I see that we've been joined by council member Rosenthal. Um, so my office has been made aware that labor brokers specifically target vulnerable populations such as immigrants, undocumented uh, residents or just as affected workers, including folks who need a job as a part, uh, part of their parole requirements. Um, we've also heard that labor brokers exploit these groups by withholding their pay and not providing workers with adequate safety training um, and equipment. Is DCWP aware? Um, I mean, obviously you are aware of the, of the rampant, but given the department's new focus on worker protections, what actions do you think that the agency can take um, to provide stronger worker protections to individuals employed by these labor brokers? Mm -hmm. So, um um, we've looked and we're not aware of having received a complaint um, from a worker employee with a body shop or labor broker specifically, right? But some of a lot of the issues that workers are complaining about, we see across other industries, obviously. That is something that for us is top of mind, thinking about how to send a message that workers can come to us, that they should not be afraid of losing their jobs because they file a complaint. So it's very important for us, and we can continue to do this, to have um, a strong um, anti-retaliation response once a worker files a complaint with us. Um, so I think that for us, again, it, it's, it's a matter of continuing to enforce the laws that we have jurisdiction over, like paid sick leave, uh, and, and in other, depending on the industry, you know, just cause protections um, and or fair work week uh, protections. But with respect to other laws, we are still, uh, you know, subject to collaborating with other enforcement agencies and, and to making sure that, again, workers know about their rights and they know where to go to to enforce them. Um, so we'll be happy to continue to work with you, with the council and with the advocates to better understand the issues these workers are facing and how, you know, how the city can act. Um, to help, um, to help make sure that workers feel like they have uh, jobs that treat them well. Is it, could you, could you commit to keeping your staff on? Um, and I know that you're usually really good about staying on for a little while um, after you have testified, but um, just because we're gonna be hearing from some, uh, some folks that have direct experience with um, these labor practices, and I and I would really, I think that we all, you know, can learn from those experience, those that, that those testimonies, right, um, and their experiences. So it would be nice if, if you, you know, if your staff or yourself, if you can hang around for a little longer. Um, Most certainly, yes. Okay. Um, so I will now turn it over to uh, Stephanie to see. If there's anyone, any other council yeah. members, any questions? Thank you, Chair. I'll now call on other council members to ask their questions in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin. Uh, first, we'll hear from Council Member Chen. Council Member? Time starts now. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. I know that um, 
way back, we worked on the employ licensing employment agencies and getting material translated. So all the memories are coming back in terms of all the effort that was made on that front. Um, in your testimony, uh, you talked about, I think one of the issues is pay equity. Um, so one of my questions is that, how do we ensure pay equity? I mean, is there a way to um, get the employer um, to show the amount of money that they're getting uh, from the company they're contracting them. And I think that that's an issue we have to sort of look at how do we deal with these so-called, like for example, the real estate company. I mean, in the long run, they're saving money uh, because they have to pay more for union labor, uh, but there's such a big gap in terms of like $15 for the worker and $40 go to uh, the broker. Um, labor broker, that's one thing. The other thing is that, are we able, uh, or do we need legislation to mandate that these labor broker agencies or body shops, uh, that they also have to give uh, the consumer bill of right? Like whoever is working uh, for them or, take, or using their service or being hired by them, that they should know what their rights are, that they are protected uh, by all the uh, laws, you know, state laws, city laws um, that you talked about, uh, the commission that you talked about earlier. So at least they know what their rights are. And if they have a complaint, uh, they know where to go. Are we able to do that to mandate them? If not, can we do it through legislation? Um, okay, so let me, let me, hopefully I can answer your questions and, and my team can help me if I forget something, if I got something wrong. Um, with respect to pay equity, I just want to make sure it's, it's, it's Claire Ayala who should be credited with mentioning in her testimony. And um, there are two different things here. Um, if we're talking about pay equity between union employees and non-union employees, um, you know, um, again, the minimum wage obviously is, is mandated by the state, right? It's not New York City that uh, uh, that has the authority to pass on the minimum wage. So. Um, it's state law, and I think, uh, as you know, state law will require that at least the minimum wages are paid, right? So for a, um, a company, a business that is, you know, privately hiring workers and employing them, unless I believe there may be some uh, contracts with the state or the city in terms of construction or other type of contracts that require a higher wage, I think the only requirement will be that they pay at least a minimum wage and then overtime wages for every hour after 40 that they work. So I think that that's, um, th that's just a difference between like when you talk about equity, if you're talking about union versus non-union, I think um, there's going to be that challenge that the minimum wage, again, will still be uh, $15 uh, across the state. Is, uh, is it possible to to sort of kind of say that you, you can't, like the agency cannot um, get more than what they're paying the worker or there's a percentage. I mean, if you look at the example, right? If you're paying $40 uh, to the labor broker and you're only paying, and then they're only paying 15. I mean, so they're taking in more than half of what they're getting from the company mm -hmm. that's hiring them. So there's something unfair about that. So is there any way that we can uh, regulate that or to sort of, you can't do more than a certain percentage? Um, so I think that you are aware, like at least in New York City, New York City um, has a, a living wage statute mm -hmm. um, and for certain public works projects that's, you know, the city actually has some role where they can demand a higher wage, like I, but I believe that hasn't been updated in a while. Um, so, but, and I also, I'm not an expert in this issue, so I don't want to talk, you know, broadly about it, only to say that I know that there, there's that exists um, New York City living wage, both the controllers of it and our agency have some jurisdiction to enforce that, uh, but it needs to be updated. Um, but then the other part of your question regarding, can we force these companies, these labor brokers to actually um, give, I, give, I believe you said consumers, believe, give them certain notices, right? Um, so I just want to make sure that we're clear that there's two different things, right? The um, permanent, 
the employment agency law, which is the one that we work together to make sure materials were available to consumer in different languages. Those employment agencies are not employers of those consumers, right? They're just acting as a business entity, providing a service to a consumer and consumers have certain rights there. But if we're talking about a temp agency or a labor broker that is an actual employer of those individuals, and those workers have other rights, not as consumers, but as employees. And they okay, employees. So can we mandate that the employer, be this temp agency and this labor broker, that they have, give their worker uh, the bill of rights, like what, what they have in terms of pay sick leave, right. um, overtime, so yeah. that the, the people who are employed by them at least know what their rights are and where they can complain if they know that they're being, you know, violated. Yeah. Absolutely. And, they, and actually, the, those requirements are explicit in several of the laws, right? Paid sick leave has its own inclusion there that says businesses have to display a poster and give every worker a notice that they're covered by this law. Similarly, with state laws and federal laws, employers are required to post the signs that say what the minimum wage is and where to go to file a complaint. The problem is going to be, are the businesses actually always posting these or not, right? And in those cases, it's, again, it's about enforcement. Uh, do we have a presence there to make sure that businesses are complying with these laws or not? It's a different question from like the protections are in existence, but how many businesses are actually complying with that? But do you have the authority to go and inspect these businesses to see if they are complying? Let's say with start with just the pay sick leave law. Are they posting those signs or yes. giving out those information? Yes, we do for municipal workplace laws, for paid sick leave, for fair work week, for just cause. For those laws, we can. We cannot issue a violation if we walk into a business and we don't see a minimum wage poster there. We cannot issue a violation. We may be able to refer it to the Department of Labor, but we don't have a jurisdiction to actually say to the employer, you're, like, you know, you're not complying with the law, right? So, um, so for our laws, yes, for municipal workplace laws, we can enforce and we do, and we try to be creative too in certain cases, for instance, with Starbucks, we recently investigated Starbucks for, for solve the case for paid sick leave violations, and we require Starbucks to post um, visible to the consumers so that we take advantage of this free marketing for us that paid sick leave is the law so that workers and consumers know about that right. Um, and if you do see a Starbucks shop that does not have that posted, let us know because we'd like to check on that. So yeah, but we're limited to the laws that the city enforces. Yeah, and I, I would also just want to mention that just our like the, the idea of body shops was like somewhat of a novel concept for us. And we definitely did a little bit of research ahead of the hearing to find out a little bit more about this and what the, the issues are. And by and large, it seems like the primarily there are wage theft issues at play mm -hmm. and those are strictly in the jurisdiction of the state so there's so mm -hmm. i think as the commissioner mentioned there may be and often is for example downstream issues for example if you're not paying someone a minimum wage you're probably not following paid safe and sick leave law pursuant to municipal workplace laws. So we would be able to act on like the second or tertiary issue at play, but typically if there is a complaint or an issue raised, it'll be that, hey, I'm not getting paid the right amount. And that would be something that does fall outside of our jurisdiction. Hmm. Okay, all right. I guess we'll, we'll have to figure out how we can do more. Um, to offer more protection. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Those are really good questions. I actually want to piggyback off of that because how many, um, uh, Stephen, how many, how many, how often is DCWP then reporting wage theft, you know, complaints to um, the New York State Department of Labor? I don't know, Commissioner, if you want to characterize the relationship, but yeah, we, we certainly do track our referrals. I don't have numbers right now, but we do track our referrals. As you can imagine, I'll, we get a lot of calls from workers with a you know, diverse array of issues. And so we then track uh, what issues refer to which agency, right? Uh, we can follow up after the hearing to give you some numbers. Yeah, we would, I, would, I would appreciate that. Um, 
All right, I have just one final question. Um, hold on one second. So do, can you, can you share, do you foresee that there would be any potential negative consequence to licensing labor brokers? I, I can't think of a negative consequence, to be honest. Again, I would love to learn more about how other cities are, localities are looking at this issue, right? And I also look forward to seeing, uh, to hearing the testimony from uh, advocates uh, to continue to think with you about potential solutions for these problems. No, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, okay. Uh, are there any other members that have questions at this point? I see no further hands raised, Chair. So seeing that there are no hand raised, we will now turn to public testimony. I would like to remind everyone that, unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelists should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before you deliver your testimony. I would like to now welcome Tierra Williams to testify, followed by Han Lu and then Nilvia Coyote. Tierra? Time starts now. Good morning. Um, my name is Tierra Williams. I am an intern at, with the Organizing Department for Labor. Labor is Local 79, and I want to thank the Chair Ayala for giving me this opportunity today. I was one of the 18 women that were um, predominantly Black um, that, uh, <clears throat> that and where we were survivors of sexual harassment and we were part of the $1.5 million lawsuit settlement um, settled by the AG's office um, with Tish James. While being on that job, we were harassed constantly and um, many of the times our complaints fell, fell on deaf ears. A lot of people were, weren't heard and none of the, our complaints were addressed by our higher ups, our supervisors. Um, we, when I was employed there, we were predominantly black and brown or formerly incarcerated and some were immigrants and they preyed on that. Um, they barely provided any enough money for survival, even anything above minimum wage didn't help. Even if we got paid over $15, because at a point I was being paid 20, at $20 I was stripped of my medical um, and dental insurance and of the food stamps that I needed at the time for me and my son. Um, and big money firms like Tradeoff um, send these laborers out to major development projects and um, just rob of, uh, rob us of our wages. Um, making anything above minimum wage wasn't the issue for me. It was more so the benefits that I needed to provide for my son and my family without, you know, at my home. Um, it was a time where we didn't have anything. I couldn't go to the doctor. I couldn't go to the dentist. Um, it's time that my son needed to be vaccinated for school and he wasn't able to and I had to pay out of pocket. So the money that I was earning, I wasn't able to completely take it home because I had to pay for everything else. So the, 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 the issue wasn't so much the pay, although wage is a major thing, is more so, you know, being me being them caring about me being able to pay, I mean, provide for my family at home. So being stripped of health care and food stamps, sometimes my son is like in love with oodles and noodles now because that's all we ate at a point. So it was really kind of rough. Um, three years ago when I joined a laborers union, um, I was I learned that many things went against my rights as a human being. And um, to keep us from becoming victims of greed, um, we should be able to collectively bargain and organize these workers. So it protects our dignity and it cre creates stability, not just for the individual, but for their families as well. Because you lose a lot of self-respect working for them, thinking that this is your only way out and this is a one-stop job. Um, also, not only that, I witnessed it from another angle. My fiance is a, is formerly incarcerated. He worked with us as well. It was really hard for him and he's been incarcerated twice after that from losing his job. So at a point it's really rough. You 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 would hope that um, these big firms like Tradeoff would, you know, open 
up their hearts to these people and um, so that they don't have to struggle so much because my boyfriend is a really good person and my son does, you know, deserve way more than I was able to give him at the time. And thank you for your time, Chair. Thank you so much, Ciara. Um, I, I we're usually gonna we usually will call on everyone else on this panel, and then I'll get back to you with a question. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Tiara. Um, next up is Han Lu, followed by Nilvia Coyote, and then Bishop Mitchell Taylor. Han. Time starts now. Good morning, Cherla and committee members. My name is Han Lu, and I'm testifying today on behalf of National Employment Law Project in strong support of this committee pursuing greater reporting and transparency of unregulated labor brokers, in this case, so-called body shops that target New Yorkers who are on parole and other forms of court-related surveillance. So there's been two trends traditionally viewed as separate that appear more and more to be the same. The first is that over the last 40 years, the US labor market has shifted from long-term relatively stable jobs with high union rates to shorter term, increasingly unstable jobs with lower wages, fewer benefits, and more obstacles to collective worker action. And the second trend is mass incarceration or criminalization the unprecedented and sprawling system of punishment and surveillance in the US that targets black and brown people. Body shops in New York exist at the intersection of these two trends and are the center of this history today. And my submitted testimony details these points. I'm happy to elaborate, um, but in short, first labor brokers, in this case, body shops, hire and pay workers for work at third party companies and profit by driving down the cost of labor, the only cost that they control. They're an engine of occupational segregation that disproportionately sorts black and brown New Yorkers uh, into second tier work status and other forms of bad work in some of the most dangerous professions, including um, in construction. The threat of poverty, second, faced by court surveilled New Yorkers is real. It has racist impact. 60% of those who've been incarcerated remain unemployed a year after release with those reporting any earnings whatsoever, reporting a median barely exceeding 10,000 annually, uh, estimated 52% less in income than those who were never arrested. The negative financial impact of an arrest or conviction record is radically anti-Black. Both Black people with and without a court record earn less annually and receive fewer callbacks from prospective employers than white people with a record. Third and finally, the threat of reincarceration for New Yorkers on parole is real. It is also racist. A recent study by Columbia University found Black and Latinx New Yorkers on parole are 12 and four times respectively more likely to be reincarcerated for technical violations than similarly situated white New Yorkers. Technical violations means there's no allegation of a new criminal offense, but instead there's an allegation that a parole condition has been broken. These conditions regularly include, quote unquote, seeking and maintaining employment. As you've heard or will hear in testimony today, court surveilled New Yorkers face pressure from the parole system or other, quote unquote, community supervision programs to accept lower work standards. There's a desperation. Whether a court surveilled worker can reject or refuse an unfair or unsafe job or organize to improve I'm that expired. job. Go ahead. No, no, no. Feel free to finish is dramatically undercut by the threat of jail, causing such workers to enter and remain in jobs with depressed labor standards. Labor brokers take advantage of this reality. So just to sum up, requiring transparency, greater reporting from what now are opaque and unregulated labor brokers will be a good first step. And I thank you, Chair, and the committee for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Han. Next up, we have Nilvia Coyote, followed by Bishop Mitchell Taylor, and then Jonathan Weston. Nilvia? Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. I just want to make sure, sure one of our members, Freddy Santiago, is on the list to testify. Yes, Nilvia, he is on the list. He's a little further down on the list, but Thank he'll be coming so much. Thank you so sure. much. Good morning, members of the Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Committee and City Council members. On behalf of the organization, New Immigrant Community Empowerment, NICE, 
I thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. My name is Nilvia Coyote and I'm the Director of Training and, and Education at NICE. I am here to speak on behalf of our community members, such as Freddie, who you will listen in a few minutes, who continue to be abused by predatory practices by employment agencies due to the lack of proper enforcement of the Justice for Job Seekers Bill passed in 2016. Employment agency fraud is a systemic issue that NICE has seen for years. Agencies take advantage of newly arrived immigrant workers, especially undocumented workers who have a hard time finding employment elsewhere. These predatory businesses are aware of how the pandemic crisis has affected immigrant workers and still continue to promote their services, promising, promising jobs they will never deliver. Regardless of the passage of the Justice for Job Seekers Bill in 2016, the pattern is always the same employment agencies charging an application fee to consumers, but then placing workers in jobs that steal their wages, deny payment, and never allocate a job to the worker. NICE has a history of tracking, researching, and denouncing these immoral practices. For years, we led the Justice for Job Seekers campaign to fight for regulation of employment agencies and for a long period of time, our own members serve, served hundreds of employment agencies to figure out what the, the practices were and collect data to show that this is a systemic problem that adversely affect our community. The result of our collective efforts was the release of an investigative report into employment agencies titled Dreams and Schemes in Queens, Immigrant Struggles to Find Work and get status in the face of consumer fraud. For our campaign, NICE convened and led a statewide coalition of over 30 organizations and drafted legislation in partnership with directly impacted community members, community organizations, advocacy and policy groups, and elected officials. In 2016, the New York State Legislature passed the Justice for Job Seekers Bill to provide fair and meaningful protection to low wage immigrant workers as they look for work in the state of New York. Our work was fundamental to understand the systemic nature of consumer frauds committed against immigrants. However, in 2021, we're still seeing employment agency fraud all the time because the law is rarely being enforced. With the COVID-19 crisis, we see more than ever, vulnerable workers with no savings and no income looking desperately for any work, falling into these predatory practices from agencies able to act with impunity because they still can. For this, we need the city and the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection to step up and protect workers by investigating and stopping employment agency fraud. All too often, unscrupulous employment agencies, both licensed and unlicensed, are still exploiting job seekers by tailoring their process to take advantage of loopholes in the current law, as illustrated in the testimony of Freddie. We need the city and the Department of Consumer and Work Protection to take concrete steps in enforcing the law with a clear, dignifying process to denounce and prevent cases like Freddie from occurring so that our immigrant workers are given the dignity entitled by, by their inviolable work for New York City. Thank you so much. Nivia, what, what, do you, what do you see as the impediment um, to DCWPs being able to enforce existing worker protection laws? What do you see as a disconnect? Thank you for um, the question. Uh, we know that the Department of Consumers is trying, and, and, and I see the commissioner here, we work um, in educating our, our members, obviously, about these practices. But we are still lacking information of a process how can people denounce? What is the process to be able to provide the information for the department, to be able to track these uh, supposed employment agencies and do a proper investigation? Uh, we believe as well that we are in need of more inspectors to be able to go to these places uh, that are basically not employment agencies to really investigate the cases and see their practices. Yeah, it, it almost feels like, you know, like the uh, the groups are very strategically looking for a specific, you know, um, workforce. And, you know, I, I, I'm, this is really helpful information. So thank you, because I think that we're all kind of learning about, 
you know, this different uh, industry. Um, and it's, it's difficult, it's difficult to regulate, right? A, a ghost agency when they're coming and going and they kind of just disappear into the wind. Um, but the level of consistency with which they, you know, um, specifically, you know, target individuals specifically, uh, you know, in, in immigrant communities and, and people of color, um, I think, you know, it should allow, you know, should allow us a better view, right, of like where they are. Um, and so I, I, my wheels are turning a little bit here. So thank you for, you know, for your testimony. And um, I wanted to kind of, um, Tiara uh, wanted to just, is Tiara still with us? I don't see her, but I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, no. She's here, yeah. I'm here. Yeah, no, I, I, I wanted to, to, to one, say thank you um, for your bravery and, and for coming forward, because I think that, right, this is important and is an important first step in, in, in terms of, one, helping us better understand legislatively how we could be helpful uh, to ensure that worker protections are extended, right, to all of the individuals that are impacted um, by th this type of, of, of practice. Um, so thank you for that, because you you know you you are doing your city and 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 your colleagues a great service by by being here today and really acting as a voice for them. Um, and I, I just wanted to know, like in your experience, um, did you were you asked to sign some sort of of, a, of an employment contract when you uh, were employed? No, we never signed it. Um, I actually never even signed. What is it? A W four form. They just ask you for your, like your social. And how did you learn about the about the job? Like, was it advertised somewhere? Was it by word of mouth? So it was from word of mouth. Someone got me the job. Um, a girl, another girl that was also in a lawsuit, um, Ashley Foster. She was a friend of mine then, and she got me the job there. Um, she told me that she would get me a job. She she told me to get my OSHA. I got my OSHA ten online. And then um, that Monday, I told him I, I had my OSHA 10, and that Wednesday, I started working. Do you have a, I mean, I, 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 well, I didn't read the, uh, the entire, I don't, I don't have a lot of, do you have an idea without this, without really sharing too much of your own personal, like what the average salary was for, for your colleagues? So no one, um, other than maybe the foreman's, made more than $20 an hour. Everyone made, when I first started working, I started making $15 an hour. After a while, I was making a, I went, on, I went on up a dollar to 16. And then they had like another sector called Trade Off Plus where we were supposed to get healthcare benefits, where we were supposed to get um, a 401k plan for retirement or whatever the case may be, which we never really received. Um, that's when we started working on jobs with um, um, other contractors, Gilbain and um, big contractors like that, that came from out of state. Um, but we never really, we never really made over twenty dollars an hour. I only know a foreman that made about twenty eight the most, and he no longer works for them. Um, and we never re received those benefits. I had um, a miscarriage on the job, and when I had the miscarriage, my health insurance wasn't even active when I went there. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to stay. I had to wait. I had the miscarriage, and then I had to wait four days because the sack was still inside to get it extracted because they had to sign me up for emergency Medicaid at the time. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that. No, no one should have to go through that. Um, what was there? Did you feel like while you were on the work site, were there, um, was there like an HR department? Was there anyone that you, uh, that you could complain to? So that was the issue. We made many complaints to the foreman, And when I had the issue that I had, it, um, it almost got physical. And um, when I made the complaint, they gave me a phone number to call saying that this was the HR. And when I called the number, no one ever answered. And I kept calling for months because my situation happened in April. And I was complaining about it until I got fired in August. They fired me for being tired of my complaints. I called HR at least twice a week from April to August. And when August came, no, the end of July came, I finally got an answer. They told me that the woman was on um, maternity leave, whoever was in HR. So I'm, I asked them, was there anyone else in place to, you know, take on her role while she was out? Come to find out she was never pregnant and there's no real HR. They were operating out of an uh, 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 office in Limbrook, mm -hmm. and they never, they never really had any, um, you know, HR wasn't really 
a business. It, they didn't at the time they didn't have any advertisements to even get the job. It was more so, uh, you know, if you knew someone that needed a job, they would you would get a job there. Or the parolees that we got there, um, my boyfriend included, came from CEO, which um, is a it's like a supposedly a training facility that really doesn't train. Um, they get sent there straight from the parole office and um, for them to get jobs. And at the time we weren't at $15, but they were, some of them were working for like eight, $9 an hour and trade off with, you know, come pick them up from there and say that they had a better opportunity for them and they were getting paid $15 an hour, but some of them didn't even have equipment, boots, proper OSHA cards, nothing. You, you were let go in August of last year? No, of 2017. Oh, 2017. And your boyfriend? Um, he, I got him into a, I got him another job because the, the, the environment was so hostile for him. Um, and I know how the male ego could be. I got him out of there and I got him working with another company. Um, that same year, a few months, maybe July. Yeah, maybe June or July. I think he left there of 2017. Well, thank you so much. This is really helpful. Thank you for letting me, allow me to speak. Okay. Thank you. Next we have uh, Bishop Mitchell Taylor, followed by Jonathan Weston and then Ryan Monell. Bishop Taylor. Time starts now. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Ayala and all of the other council members on the committee and to Commissioner Salas, who uh, I always enjoy sharing these types of platforms with. Good afternoon. My name is Bishop Mitchell Taylor. When I originally wrote this, it was morning, so forgive me. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Urban Upbound, a direct service and advocacy organization dedicated to breaking cycles of poverty in public housing neighborhoods by giving residents the tools and resources necessary for economic mobility and self-sufficiency. Uh, we're located in East Harlem in Far Rockaway, Astoria, and our flagship is in Long Island City. We do this through six integrated program areas, business development, workforce development, one-on-one -on -one financial counseling, youth development, year-round tax prep, and the Urban Upbound Federal Credit Union. There's nothing novel about any of these as they stand alone, but they become magical when you can comprehensively integrate them on campuses. And that's what we do. Thank you, Chair Diana Ayala and council members present for holding this hearing on such an important topic. Urban Upbound supports the regulations of firms exploiting vulnerable re-entry workers as the practices of these agencies are damaging to our community and individual workers. As our city and state move toward implementing criminal justice reforms, it is imperative Legislators assist re-entry workers in breaking down barriers to successful or successfully re-entering their communities as workers. One of these barriers is the scarcity of work open to those following their incarceration and the entities that use this to exploit the vulnerability of their current situation. Construction, of course, is one of the few industries welcoming formerly incarcerated individuals prompting unscrupulous firms and employees to prey on them. Body shops have emerged, firms and agencies that are funneling re-entry workers to non-union firms, offering low wages, little to no benefits, and oftentimes poor safety conditions. These firms damage the financial health of our communities and keep these re-entry keep those in the re-entry society in an impoverished state, not only financially, but mentally. Body shops are non-union construction labor brokers that engage in exploitive practices, preying on re-entry workers and offering poverty level wages. These firms are largely unlicensed and profit from using mass incarceration as a feeder system, supplying the city's richest developers with a cheap and vulnerable workforce. Body shop contractors exploit re-entry workers by taking advantage of their restricted rights following incarceration, affording them little to no protections and low wages. Body shops foster uh, cynical poverty and must be regulated to end their abusive practices. Those re-entering society cannot, cannot thrive while these labor brokers operate with little to no oversight. Regulating these shops will be instrumental in protecting re-entry workers. Urban Upbound 
is in staunch support of the regulatory body shops, regulating body shops to protect our formerly incarcerated community members. The city council has an opportunity to act to end these abuse practices and uplift those re-entering society. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Taylor. It's nice seeing you again. Yeah, we're following each other this yeah, week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bishop Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jonathan Weston, followed by Ryan Monell, and then Michael Negron. Jonathan? Time starts now. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, I want to thank the Committee on Consumer Affairs, uh, Chair Ayala, um, and for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jonathan Weston. I'm the Executive Director of the New York Communities for Change. We are one of the largest grassroots community-based organizations in the city uh, that um, has thousands of members um, and works with folks uh, that have been incarcerated um, and uh, you know coming out. And uh, we have been the, on the front lines of efforts to reform the criminal justice system in New York. We're committed to fighting for fair housing for people on probation and parole, to demand that uh, both job opportunities and job jobs with dignity for workers returning from incarceration. We have partnered with uh, Laborers Local 79 in demanding that New York City enact policies that ensure real affordability, real local hire and real livable wages. Um, we have been hearing from our partners and from members uh, about our new, a new exploitative employment model called Body Shops. Body Shops take the labor justice, the, the labor of justice affected workers and broker it at an astronomical markup uh, to the city's richest developers. Body shops take advantage of the scarce job opportunities available to formerly incarcerated New Yorkers, barriers in housing, education, employment, and disenfranchisement in the political process creates desperate workers willing to do anything to avoid returning to prison. Uh, as a city, we must step up to protect these workers. Um, we. We have to act now to protect justice affected New Yorkers re-entering our communities. The New York City Council has the responsibility to protect uh, its most vulnerable citizens against exploitative employers and dangerous working conditions. Uh, no contractor or developer should be allowed to condemn black and brown construction workers uh, to economic imprisonment and bodily harm. Uh, that's resentencing, not real re-entry. Um, so we, uh, we really urge the council to take action here and help regulate uh, this industry that has taken advantage of so many. Uh, thank you. Jonathan, are you, are you aware of any such entity where, uh, especially because you, you, you mentioned the um, uh, formerly incarcerated individuals, do you, are, you, are you aware of any such entity where they can report an abuse? Is that something that... Um, that may be through uh, communities for change. Like, are you guys fielding any complaints? Like, are you coming in contact with? Not directly ourselves. I mean, you know, there's the Department of Labor, um, but you know, we think we need more protections and more regulations in this industry as a whole, and would love for the city to really take action here and investigate folks. Now, this is a question for either you or for Bishop um, Taylor. I, 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 are you hearing from from folks about specifically coming, you know, in a, in a COVID uh, world, what the distribution of personal protective equipment looks like in in these work sites, and who, you know, who who's directly responsible for ensuring that that PPE um, is available to the workers? I'm not sure if this is something that you've heard. Any one of you. I mean, I think uh, the the main thing we hear is on unionized construction sites that um, they're doing a lot better job of it. I think that's the main thing we've been hearing. Okay. okay. Um, I really can't speak to, uh, maybe John may be able to, John Simmons who will be testifying a little later on, will be able to speak to that. Uh, but I would, I would, I would, I would, I would probably assume that they're under-resourced as it relates to many of the safety precautions uh, that are needed pre-COVID. So I think during COVID, uh, the protections that are laid on top of that, I would, I, would, I would have no confidence that they're providing the same kind of protections that other um, union sites are probably offering. 
Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Next, we have Ryan Monell, followed by Michael Negron and then John Simmons. Ryan? Time starts now. Well, th well thank you, Councilwoman Cherayala, members of the committee. My name is Ryan Monell. Uh, I'm with the Real Estate Board of New York. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, with construction jobs anticipated to grow by tens of thousands over the next few years, the construction industry provides an opportunity for thousands of New Yorkers to obtain good jobs and reach the middle class. Uh, with this in mind, Revenue continues to work collaboratively with the Building and Construction Trades Council, Building Trades Employment Association, the New York Building Congress, and others to highlight the importance of the construction and development in industries for the future of New York City's economy. Uh, Revenue believes strongly, as we've heard from many others on the call on the on the hearing today, in ensuring that all opportunities in construction are safe and fair. Basic principles, particularly important to uphold for vulnerable New Yorkers who have been formerly incarcerated or otherwise have been historically disenfranchised. As with many industries, wage uh, theft, unsafe conditions, and other issues have been documented in the construction industry. Among other instances of these practices, this includes allegations that so-called body shops prey on socioeconomically vulnerable uh, workers, including people of color and particularly formerly, formerly incarcerated individuals. Addressing these issues merits the attention and action of policymakers. To that end, Red recommends the council consider the following proposals. The council should consider increasing funding to support uh, DCA, WP, and other agencies to better protect justice involved in other vulnerable New Yorkers for wage theft. Um, if allegations of companies working as body shops are found to be true, the strongest steps should be taken to ensure that all workers are afforded the full protections of the law. The council should also consider proactive opportunities to grow the construction industry as an avenue for a more just and equitable workforce. Uh, Revenue recognizes that private sector union construction is essential to the development of New York City, and our members account for most of union construction contracts. However, it is not practical, practical, uh, practicable to contract union work for the entirety of all jobs. Uh, moreover, because of practical constraints in union membership, there's a sizable pool of workers looking for jobs in construction need to be found alternative paths. With that said, the council should consider legislation that would create an elevated minimum wage with benefits for construction projects that receive government assistance. Under this model, if a site receives government assistance, workers on the site would be guaranteed to be paid a wage and benefit that exceeds the minimum wage. Such a policy should also include local hiring requirements as well as reporting and disclosure requirements to provide transparency into who is working on the job site. Uh, Revenue stands ready to work with the council to help create good jobs for all workers. And we appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Chair Ayala. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan, do you have any idea? And I'm, I'm, I'm forgive my ignorance, but what responsibility, if any, does the the developer uh, share in identifying this practice is not happening on their work sites? Yeah, well, we appreciate the question. Um, you know, from my knowledge, we don't have any members, at least with Revney, that um, are participating uh, in utilizing labor from body shops. Um, with that said, if it, it is something that is found to be um, occurring on job sites, uh, we should work with the city and with the council in particular to make sure that the protections of those workers are upheld and that any illegal practices is, is, um, is stomped out. Um, we think that we could also you know, potentially help uh, in particular formerly incarcerated individuals and, and those from, um, for, you know, disenfranchised communities uh, to, to, to have an entree into um, construction uh, through other non-for-profits that are actually doing very good work across the city. One is actually has been very successful in your district as Building Skills New York. Um, they've placed about 1,000 individuals over the last two years in, in good construction jobs. Uh, some that have led to uh, opportunities in, in, in union uh, trades. Um, and we want to continue to work with the council uh, to find um, opportunities um, for more and more individuals. So it's a matter of helping not only uh, find opportunities for investigation into illegal practices, but also identifying uh, those organizations in, in the city, as well as uh, many of our members who are working to try to find opportunities for New Yorkers um, to, to get into the construction fields. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. 
Next, we have Michael Negron, followed by John Simmons, and then Freddie Santiago. Michael? Time starts now. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Michael Negron, and I used to work for a body shop called SLG Construction. Body shops in New York City are targeting Black workers with the stories of incarceration, people like me. These body shops offer us empty promises of gainful employment and chances of advancement. They are profiting off our labor and paying us less than the value of our work. Working for a body shop is like being held hostage to the pay and work conditions dictated to us. For many body shops, workers failing to be employed is a parole violation that could get you sent back to prison. That work requirement makes us especially vulnerable to exploitation by body shops. We are paid low wages while body shops get rich. SLG worked for some of the largest non-union general contractors, including Gilbane, Triton, and TG Nickel. SLG charged nearly twice my pay rate for every hour I worked. My boss at SLG acted like he was doing me a favor by allowing me to work on dangerous construction sites, breaking my back at low wages. SLG's management constantly diminished us, even once trying to stop me from using the public bathroom. While SLG's management was leaving the clean restroom, they directed me to use a dirty temporary facility. I felt like being told I was a separate and not equal. SLG knew how to hold my criminal history over my head, but my coworkers and I started to speak up for ourselves. I knew there was a risk to me being fired, but I took a stand and tried to organize. I reached out to coworkers, attended organizing meetings, and helped run a petition drive to advocate for better wages for all SLG employees. SLG legally demanded me to stop organizing. When I refused, I was fired. Eventually, with the help of Local 79, I filed charges with the National Labor Relations Board, which resulted in SLG paying my lost wages. My story is just one example, but it shows how willingly Brody, uh, body shops are to degrade Black reentry workers. They do not care about our livelihoods, well-being, or rights. Forcing reentry workers into dead ends, jobs, and body shops is no different than hiding us away in prison. Our problems do not disappear when we are forced into the shadows. Many thousands of Black New Yorkers who serve time in prison are trying to re-enter the economy and make a positive contribution to the neighborhoods where we lived and built. Non-union construction is one of the few industries where we can find jobs after incarceration. I would ask the city council to bring accountability to, bo to body shops. People leaving prison face many obstacles, but you can take action to eliminate the exploitation of body shops as one of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you for coming um, to testify. I know that this, you know, this is not easy. And I'm and I'm sorry that that you had to work on the documents and to be made to feel inferior to anyone. But I applaud the fact that you didn't allow that to be your narrative and that you took control of the situation and were able to, um, you know, align yourself with such great, you know, groups such as Local 79. Um, and you know, I I, I think fortunately the problem is right that um, you're probably the exception and not the rule, and so many people would just give up because they just wouldn't right um you get, yeah you get beat down so much um that you sometimes start to believe it and i i, I appreciate your you know your ability to come you know and, and testify before this body today because i think you know as, as as i mentioned before um you know this is really helpful because i think that others that are in, in similar situations will see this right and and feel empowered yeah well. so you know not only were you able to get yourself out of the situation but you're creating you know, uh, an environment um, that tells others that it's okay to speak up and that we shouldn't have to sit and take it. Um, and we're hoping that through the, you know, through the legislation at the city council that we'll, we'll be able to work, you know, collaboratively uh, to make sure that what happened to you um, and what happened to Tiara doesn't continue to happen to anyone else. So thank you so much for your testimony. Yes, definitely. There's a whole bunch of people that's, you know, put in the same position I'm put in and they're scared to speak up because, you know, they still have to take care of their family. You know, people is living literally, if if they can, paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. struggling, you know what I'm saying? And I was one of them. And um, I spoke up and, you know, Local 79 helped me to the max. Well, we're going to count on that big mouth now. You got to go and go to all those work sites and educate. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Thank you, Michael. All right, no problem. I think John is next. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Next, yes, next we have John Simmons followed by Freddie Santiago. John? Time starts now. Uh, good morning, my name is John Simmons. I'm sorry, I'm a little overwhelmed right now just to know that so many people are fighting for someone like myself in this situation. <laughs> I am a proud construction worker. I want to formally thank Chairperson Diana Ayala and the entire city council for allowing me this, allowing me this unfounded opportunity to shine light on the most wickedest and unfair conditions in the workplace. And that's called the body shops. My story, my story is far from being unique. Unfortunately, many people like myself share this unruly circumstance and pitfall by being affected by the justice system. When we are released from the penal system, we all look forward to our release and becoming productive members of the societies that we live within. Only to be welcomed by predatory employees who use our criminal background to disadvantage us. The day I was released from prison, I made a personal commitment and promise to myself to never return. I was hungry, I had determination, I wanted success. It didn't take long to realize that the system has something planned for me that, that, that had something planned for me and those who are like me. I was unemployable in the eyes of society because even though I paid my debt to society as most of us do, I was still judged by society as being in that incarceral state. There weren't many opportunities for me other than low wage jobs that could not even cover the basic survival needs. I ended up going to a place called CEO, Center for Employment Opportunities. This is where I was introduced to this thing called the body shop, where they already knew that it didn't matter what type of job I took, as long as it would help keep me out of prison and keep my freedom. What is extremely dangerous about these body shops is that they have very much awareness about our freedom and that it revolves around them. The first stipulation that one receives when he comes home from parole and about 99.5% of people get this is that you must seek, obtain and maintain employment. That is the first stipulation. They are also aware that the power of our freedom lies in their hands. So they use this to force us into working in unsafe, unhealthy and unsanitary conditions. They know that we are blocked from working in many industries. So they drive our wages down and they deny, the needed, they deny us the needed benefits such as healthcare. I came home from prison and had a toothache for three years working in a body shop. Many of, many of us know that we are not being treated fairly, oh, but, we remain, but we remain quiet because we fear retaliation. And we would in some cases, some of us would probably return to prison on a parole violation. So we just constantly keep quiet. Per New York state law, we cannot even participate in labor protests. There is no real freedom for us. And these body shops are aware of this formality. It wasn't until I was introduced to the unionized trades that I finally gained my freedom. Local 79 changed my life. I am able to now be financially secure. Body shops are a real threat to people like me. I sincerely beg this council today to regulate them and protect these men and women who only want that two second chance at life and be able to have a life being productive members in this society. And I thank you so much in advance, proud local 79 member John Simmons. <laughs> John, we thank you. And, and, and we're looking to do just that. And, and, and the reason that we're doing that is because of your advocacy and, and your voice. Because, you know, quite frankly, we don't have all of the answers and we don't always know everything that's happening um, and all of the injustices that are being committed against New Yorkers and, and the most, you know, uh, the, the, the impacted communities. Um, and so I, you know, want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming, you know, um, and testifying today. And again, for uniting your voice um, with that of, of, of your team upstairs at the local uh, to really make this, bring this, you know, to, to, to our attention. Um, 
and, and, and you know, forced us to look at it and to prioritize it because we want to make sure that, you know, no one gets treated this way. Um, there's no reason why you should have to fear, you know, being incarcerated because, you know, people are exploiting you um, in, the, in that way. I'm happy to hear that your situation has gotten better. Um, and I'm happy to hear that you are now a part of the, uh, the local um, 79 team. Um, I think, you know, the world of them and, and thank you. And we're here and we have your back. So I, I want you to know that you're not alone. Um, you have a lot of really great council members on this body. Uh, council member Chin has been with us, you know, uh, council member Yeager um, who are here uh, to be, to try to be helpful. And so your testimony today will help us to kind of figure out what that help looks like and what, you know, what we are able to do to help. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Finally, we have Freddy Santiago next. He will be giving his testimony in Spanish and after his testimony, an English translation will be provided. Freddy, please begin. Um, starts now. Buenas tardes, apreciado Comité del, del, de Protección al Consumidor y al Trabajador. Mi nombre es Freddy Salvador, un inmigrante de Guatemala. Vivo en Jackson Heights, Queens. Soy miembro de la organización New Immigrant Empowerment Nights. Agradezco hoy por la oportunidad de testificar en esta audiencia sobre las agencias de trabajo cuyos servicios abusivos nos siguen afectando como consumidores y inmigrantes trabajadores en esta ciudad nos ponen al borde de la sobrevivencia como consecuencia de la crisis provocada por la pandemia. Hace más de un año yo perdí mi trabajo como busboy en un restaurante. En casa no solo era yo sin trabajo, sino también mis sobrinas recién llegadas de Guatemala. Todos estábamos angustiados sobre cómo íbamos a sobrevivir y así empecé a buscar ingreso donde fuera posible, en la limpieza o construcción. En noviembre de 2020, al verme presionado por las deudas y desesperado, localicé un anuncio en el diario de New York donde buscaban personas de, para trabajar de limpieza sin experiencia pre, previa, prometiendo entre 18 a 25 dólares la hora. Lleno de esperanza, llamé a los números y acudí al lugar citado. Ya ahí me enteré sobre el nombre de la supuesta agencia Dynamic Safari Solution Training, que operaba dentro de una tienda de armas en español. El encargado nos prometió trabajo de limpieza a cambio de dar 160 dólares por un uniforme y otros 140 por el curso de OSHA. Por adelantado, mis sobrinas y yo pagamos la cantidad de 300 dólares y esperamos por un mes el curso y la llamada para colocarnos en el trabajo de limpieza, pero ni siquiera nos dieron el uniforme En total pagamos 900 dólares y aunque recibimos recibos hechos a mano y un documento con la descripción del servicio, esta agencia de trabajo nunca llegó a cabo lo prometido. Al ir a reclamar me encontré con mucha más gente como yo, inmigrantes latinos desesperados por la falta de trabajo y por la pandemia, sin información adecuada, cayendo en las mismas redes de engaño. Cuando llamé a la policía, me dijeron que no podían hacer absolutamente nada. Cuando acudí al 311, me dije, me di, no me pudieron ayudar. El resultado es que perdimos dinero y con ello las esperanzas de volver a trabajar. La cantidad de 900 dólares significa mucho dinero para nosotros, sobre todo tras un año sin trabajar. Cuando fui a la agencia, pensaba que encaminaba a mis sobrinas a encontrar un trabajo digno por fin tras tantos meses sin ganar dinero y sin saber las hice víctimas de este engaño. Ahora quiero evitar que más compañeros y compañeras caigan en esta trampa y pierdan su dinero y esperanza. Que las, las y los miembros de NICE han luchado desde hace dar la ley que evitan que agencias pidan dinero antes de otorgar los servicios. Hoy vengo a demandar que se cumpla el BID Justice for Job Seekers, que se haga justicia y que ningún compañero más sufra de estos despojos. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Freddy. Um, I'm going to translate for him. Um, good afternoon, members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. 
My name is Freddy Santiago Salvador. I'm an immigrant from Guatemala. I live in Jackson Heights, Queens, and I'm a member of the organization New Immigrant Community Empowerment NICE. I am grateful today to have the opportunity to testify on employment agencies. These agencies whose abuses, services, and practices continue to negatively affect us as consumers and as new immigrants to New York City put many of us on the brink of survival. As a consequence of the crisis, which was caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, I lost my job as a busboy in a restaurant a year ago. At home, I was not the only one who lost a job. My nieces hadn't worked either. We were all anxious about how we were going to survive. So I began to look for employment opportunities from whatever jobs were available in cleaning or construction whenever an immigrant can find a work. In November of 2020, with the financial pressure of debt and desperation, I found an ad in the newspaper Diario de Nueva York, which indicated that they were looking for people to do cleaning work with a salary between 18 and to $25 per hour. I was hopeful, so I called the numbers in the ad and went to the address only to find employment. Once I arrived at the location, I noticed the advertised agency was operating out of a gun store. At the moment, I learned the name of the agency, Dynamic Safety Solutions Training, which is located at 4701 Van Damme Street, Long Island City. My two nieces and I communicated with the person in charge in Spanish, and they promised us multiple, multiple jobs. For the cleaning job, they asked us to pay $160 for a uniform in advance. And additionally, we had to pay for the OSHA course an amount of 140 in advance. Both my nieces and I paid the full amount of 300 each one. And we waited for a month for the OSHA class and for a call from the agency to place us in the cleaning job. In total, we paid $900 to the agency. And even though we received handwritten receipt and a document with the description of the services to confirm our transaction, this employment agency never found us a job, never trained us and never gave us the uniforms we paid for in advance. They didn't follow through with any of their promises. On several occasions, I went back to the agency to inquire, but found no one. What I did find were many other Latino immigrants in similar circumstances, desperately looking for work, affected by the economic crisis and the pandemic. None of them listened to my warning, falling into the same networks of deception. When I called the police, they told me they couldn't do anything. When I called 311, they couldn't help me either. The result is that we lost money and with it, the hope of going back to work during these dire times. $900 is a significant amount of money for us, especially after losing my job due to the pandemic. When I went to the agency, I thought I was supporting my nieces to find a dignifying job after many months of without earning an income. The devastating reality without knowing is that I made them victims of this deception. Now I want to prevent more members of my community from falling into this trap and losing their money and their hopes. Members of NICE have fought for years to pass the law that prevent agencies from asking for fees before allocating jobs. Today, I come to demand the enforcement of the Justice for Job Seekers Bill and that justice be served and no one more person to suffer from these abuses. No one more immigrant worker. Thank you very much. Gracias, Freddy, por venir a testificar. Yo tengo unas preguntitas, pero dame un segundito. Um, I, I wanted just to say thank you to Freddy for coming to testify. And I have a, a, a couple of questions for him. But before we lose John, I think that we lost Michael. Um, I want to, uh, John, are you still are you still with us? Can you hear us? I know that seems like he's working. John? No, we'll, we'll, we'll keep trying. Um, uh, Freddy. Cuando, cuando, cuando llamaste el 311, en, en, cualquier, ¿en algún momento te devolvieron la llamada de alguna otra agencia donde podría solicitar una, una creencia? Uh, sí, este, me dieron el número de una abogada, pero ella este, me pidió el correo electrónico y al final este, nunca me solucionó nada. So, uh, the, the, the question to Freddy was really... Um, you know, he, he uh, in his testimony, stated that he contacted 311 um, to file a complaint, a formal complaint. Um, so I was asking if 
by virtue of that call, there was any follow up from any city agencies and he did receive um, communication um, or at least was referred to an attorney. Um, but he he's saying that he also did not hear back from them. Me, lo siento muchísimo que te haya pasado eso, Freddy, y, y estamos trabajando muy fuerte en, en, en el comité para tratar de legislar este, este tipo de abuso um, para que no, sucede, no siga sucediendo lo que te sucedió a ti y a tu familia. Lo siento muchísimo porque entiendo la dificultad que deben estar pasando, especialmente durante la pandemia, um, y, y lo que te sucedió no debe de haber sucedido. So I, my apologies to, to, to Freddy. Um, you know, uh, we're working really hard through through the committee um, to try to figure this out and, and come up with a legislative, um, you know, remedy to this um, because, you know, I, I, no one should have to go through that, but to have to, you know, further be victimized in the midst of a pandemic when, you know, obviously, you know, money is so scarce, um, it's, it's really just as criminal um, in nature, it's what it is. Um, I'm happy that John, I see that John is back. John, um, no, I, I was here. I just couldn't answer. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. still here. I kind of figured we, I, I saw you. Um, so could you, could you, since you were uh, recently employed um, or not, not that long ago, could you tell us, I'm sure that it, it's probably predates the, the, the pandemic, but were any, who, who provided, who on the work site was responsible for providing um, the tools necessary for you to do the job um, and who was, directing the work on the site? Um, as far as the PPE, personal protective equipment, um, the contractor is supposed to provide us with everything except for work boots. Um, you know, face masks, respirators, N95 masks. Um, that is supposed to be um, supplied to us by the contractor. A lot of times, a lot of times, especially during the pandemic, they didn't have it was hard to get, you know, like uh, masses and everything, uh, N95 masses. So um, my company, who I worked for at that time, which was a subcontractor, the body shop, um, Marin Laborers, um, they supplied us. They brought the masks out and everything else. Um, as far as the tools on the job, all tools comes from the um, contractor, the GC, the general contractor. Um, so basically, PPE, PPE. The only thing that you're responsible for is your steel toe boots. Um, everything else should be provided by uh, for you by the contract. Okay. Uh, sometimes they say, you know, now, now, now being with the union, um, I know, you know, like my hard hats and everything else is provided for the company I work with. But before that, I was responsible for my own hard hat as well. Mm. And who on the work site was uh, was responsible for directing the work on on the site? Um, well, we would, we would come on the site and we would, I was, a I was actually a foreman with the body shop. Um, I was actually a foreman with the body shop. So I would go on site and, um, I would actually take, um, my directive from the supers, the project managers, uh, the assistant supers. And then I would let the guys know what we had to do for the day. Are foremans trained differently than, than regular workers? Um, well, well, to be honest, I, I, um, I learned a lot of my skills. Um, one thing about being incarcerated and being in prison is when you're there, they do have a lot of trades and, and the prison system and the penal system. So I took a lot of, um, you know, I took a lot of like, you know, trades um, in my years of being incarcerated. And um, when I was released, uh, you know, I had skills in the construction industry just from, you know, doing the courses and in, in, while I was incarcerated. But actually when I went to the body shop, when I went to the body shop, they hired me with no training at all. They mm -hmm. didn't know if I knew a broom from a shovel. They didn't know if I knew a, hand, a hammer from a screwdriver. They, they, I went to CEO, CEO introduced me to the body shop. They did some type of online um, application, filled it out and I was working. Um, but you know, as I said, I, I had so much experience with working, you know, in construction just by the trades and, and knowing that I advanced pretty pretty fast. But even in an advancement, I was still I was still underpaid. Um I was still being used. I was still at a disadvantage. Um and um but they 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 hired guys with no training at all. I mean, and you know, as a foreman, as a foreman for them, when guys came to work with me. 
they didn't know anything about being on a construction site. And and that's one thing I have to say as well as with uh, Local 79, I'm proud, I'm happy, and I thank them so much. I'm so grateful today because I know that they have apprenticeships classes and they have, you know, P2A and they have everything else to train you before you, they put you, you know, out in the field. Because, you know, after a police officer and a fireman, being a construction worker, no matter what title you have on a construction site, it's a dangerous job. It dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. You know, you have a lot of, you have a lot of pitfalls on a construction site. And if you're not properly trained, I've seen a lot of guys get hurt when I was with the body shop. And, and it, you know, I'm, I was so, I didn't mean to cry. I didn't mean to, no. um, but that, that's my feeling. I'm, I'm very passionate. And especially to know that there's so many people out there trying to help, you know, people like myself. Um, but I've seen many people get hurt. And the thing that hurt me about people, I even got hurt, you know, when I was with the body shop. And if it wasn't for, the, for me being such a hard and good worker, I would probably be in debt, you know, like with medical bills right now. But the GC, the general contractor offered to pay all my medical bills. Or, you know, I didn't have insurance or anything. So, you know, I even got hurt. So, you know, it's, it's very pertinent. It's very pertinent, very important that, that, you know, as I said before, something be done about the situation of being people taking advantage of people like myself. It, it's, oh, it's, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I heard some of the people saying they heard about it. They, you know, I lived it. I lived it. I actually lived it. And, and that's why I'm so passionate to know that people are, are trying to do something to make a difference. I lived it. And it's, it's, it's unfair. It's unfair to to so many people. It's 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 hard. It's you know. I heard I heard Tiara Williams say you know um, you know about her son. You know I I you know I came home. You know you come home from prison from doing 10, 15 years, and you get a job making fifteen dollars an hour. That that fifteen years you was gone, everything inflation. Everything went up. You can't you can't survive. You can't live. No kind of way. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, John. This is really Here nice. I see Tierra Williams has her hand up as well. Hi, Tierra, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to real quick piggyback uh, off of what John was saying. I worked on an open shop job when I got into the union, first job I've ever had in the union. And I loved it. I learned a lot of stuff that I didn't know when I was non-union. But you can definitely tell the ma major difference between the companies because the open shop job is when you have union and non-union contractors working on the same job because they, um, you know, come to agreement to have certain trades that a union and non-union work on the same job, right? I fell on the job and I was injured um, to where my right leg went dead and there were two contractors on a job, one union, one non-union. The non-union job contractor prevailed over the union contract on the job. And if I wasn't a union worker, I would have been completely screwed. So I fell down the steps on some ice um, due to weather conditions. And um, when I fell down the steps, I could not walk. They had to carry me from the 62nd floor to the hoist all the way downstairs. They tried to make me walk from the nurse's office to a cab. And I then found out that if I would have walked from there to the cab, it would have limited the liability of the company. Right. And they were just basically trying to cover themselves. But as a union member, I have a business agent at the time. It was Nikki. And he came and he said, Tierra, sit here. We're going to have an ambulance. They refused to call me an ambulance. I had the Nikki was there in less than 20 minutes, maybe less than 10. He got there really fast. But if it wasn't for Nikki as my union representative for me that day, I wouldn't have known what my rights were. You know what I mean? So I would have walked there. I wouldn't have been able to get on the ambulance, I wouldn't have been able to be rushed into the hospital. If I would have went in the cab, I would have been sitting in the emergency room for hours. You come in through the ambulance, The I didn't know the company had to pay for it. If I would have went in the cab, I would have had to pay for it through my own insurance. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of things that people don't know. And myself as an um, intern with the organizing department, and it's, it's my job now to educate them based on the experiences that I have, based on all the things that I'm, I'm learning. Um, I don't frown upon people that work non-union because a job is a job and you need it. You know what I mean? You need to work for your family. You need to provide for yourself. You need to work to stay free. I know I've worked along a lot of people that although working non-union, they still were committing other crimes or 
or um, doing other things for other incomes that weren't legal and were risking their freedom all over again. And even as a union, we pay dues and stuff like that too. It's not like they're robbing us, we're paying for representation to know what our rights are. Unlike these people are taking half of our money, not representing us and just putting us out there just to you know, um, survive alone. It's a lot like he didn't know different tools. I didn't know a uh, nail from a screw at the time. Like I didn't learn anything working with trade off. And they just threw me out there and it's really, really dangerous. And if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, you're supposed to have someone teaching you. And then when things happen, you're supposed to have a representative. And as a union, that's what they provide for you. And um, me learning that is pushing me to teach everyone else that I come encounter with that is non-union. And I've met over, I've met almost 200 non-union workers that I, I, I speak to on a regular basis and I show up at their jobs, things happen. I let them know what um, is supposed to happen, what's not supposed to happen, what things can be done. And I am very blessed to be here to be able to represent for them and to be able to talk to them and teach them what they're supposed to do. Cause other than that, there's not too many, there's no one on their job to do that. And I was lucky enough that when I was non-union, I had 79 on the job with me. Mike Vada was my first friend. Um, he was a shop steward and he was the only one that taught me. Um, I've never been a, a mason tender, but I know how to tend the masons because he taught me while we were working non-union. And I've been blessed to do so through my union. It's not that I, I don't, I don't praise them because these are the people that um, pay me. I praise them because these are these are my friends, these are my family. My my work is my family, my home is my family, and they both coexist together. I've been able to provide for them. I've been able to spend time with them. When I was working on you, I was working six in the morning to sometimes 10 p.m. at night. I didn't have a real work schedule. They called me and whatever. I was working Monday through Sunday. Some people don't get to live a life, especially when they, they come out of prison. So you want them to have the available freedoms that there are. Um, financially and um, being able to sustain themselves, you know, have some type of stability for their families. And a lot of these formerly incarcerated people and women with children and black and brown immigrants do not have that. And through the unions, we have that. So I don't, I've, honestly, I'm baffled that this is an argument anymore. Like I'm, I'm only 32 and I haven't been in that long, but it's upsetting that this is still an argument as to why these things are in place and why they should be, why they are necessary. Yeah, I'm going to assume that the answer is no, but did you ever see a bill of rights posted um, anywhere on these work sites or did maybe Michael can. I've seen one, but it was on a union site, non-union no. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, Commissioner Salas, is there, is it possible for uh, someone to follow up with Freddie? Yes, certainly. I wrote down dynamics, but I need a little more. So yes, we will follow up with Freddie, Freddie and with Nice. Freddie, um, la Commissioner Salas um, va, va a tener um, personal que, que va a, a llamarlo para pedirle más información sobre su caso para ver cómo podemos ayudar. Thank you. Here, I also see Councilmember Chin has her hand raised to ask a question. Uh, Councilmember Chin, I can see you. Go right ahead. Time starts now. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I really want to thank um, um, all of you for testifying today and really alerting us to this really important issue. Um, and I think in the council, we will find a way uh, to really help protect these workers. Um, I mean, the story is just so heartbreaking. And I wanted to ask, um, I know like, uh, was that Jane who testified before? Or Tierra? Um, John. Oh, John, yeah. Yes. Yeah I, yeah, I guess when you're working on the site, um, were that the union, that were there, were they sort of like, how did, how did they recruit you to really get you into the union? So they, um, yeah, if you work on a site that's union and non-union, how do you encounter them? Were they, did they have the opportunity to really talk with you and get you into the union or get you into a program in the union? 
with me, I was, Mike Battle was the shop steward at the time and he worked as a kind of like an organizer there. He oh, okay. was letting us know um, of all our rights th right then and there. That's how I learned of the union. That's how I learned of 79. And then um, 79 has, 70, they, they opened the doors um, to get in every couple of months. I think it was maybe once or twice a year at the time. And he would let us know when to apply for the job. And um, I applied for it before. And then after that, I had an issue with, um, with um, the non-union work. And me and Mike spoke about it. And he was just educating me on how many unions there were. And then he introduced me to programs like new. And I, we just started spreading the news. It was more so like a word of mouth thing. Nothing like, oh, come over to the union. You can just get in. Uh, not like, you know, that wasn't, he was just letting us know that there was other routes. He didn't just drag us over. He educated us. That's good. Yeah, because that's another group that, that the council support, which is new. Uh, training for women, especially um, in the construction industry. Um, so, John, how did you get contact with the union? Um, I, I got in contact with the union. I went to a apprenticeship class called P2A. Okay. Um, I, I actually went online and I was one of the 2,000 people that they were bringing into the classroom, the apprenticeship training program. And uh, that's how I actually, I mean, I've always known about the union, you know, um, for years. And, um, you know, that's where I wanted to be coming home. As I said, I, I came home determined not to return to um, prison. I was hungry. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to remain free. I wanted to be a productive member of my society. And um, so when they put the uh, the lotto pick out, I um, went straight. I, I went down there. I, I filled out the application online. They gave me a number. I went. I got in. Um, I did the classes. And I actually didn't come into the union after the classes because at that time I got a I got a job offer from another job as a foreman, uh, making 30 something dollars an hour with another construction company. And so I went there, but uh, when I got there, it just didn't work out. They didn't have the benefits there as well. I was making more money, but I had no no coverage. I had no benefit. So, um, and I just stayed in contact with a lot of people that I met in the 79. And, you know, I guess they, they knew my heart. They, they knew my, my, my way and, and they believed in me and I, I'm grateful and I just thank them so much. They and my family, as Ciara said, I, I love everyone in Local 79. You know, it's 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 not every man's for itself as everyone stands together, you know, and I love it. It's just nobody 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 cares about um nobody cares about our past, you know. If, if you're willing to do something different and make it right, they stand for you. And that's what reentry is all about. That's great. John, when you when you were testifying, you said that you went to a, a group called CEO, and then they refer you to a body shop. Oh, uh, that's what is the CEO? Which CEO is Community Employment Opportunity. Um, and I went there, and I went there, and I think I was getting a check every day for about fifty dollars or forty-seven dollars after taxes, just enough, just enough to get to work every day. Um, and, you know, they was talking about getting everybody jobs. And from there, I was introduced to the body shop of uh, construction job. That's yeah, we should find out who, right. what CEO is. I think, Commissioner, like, what kind of organization is that that refer people to predatory employers? I mean, I think we should definitely take a look at that um, to make sure that there are legitimate, you know, nonprofit organizations that can help people would re-entry and re, re referring you to um, good jobs, not like referring you to these uh, body shops. Certainly, and I, and I think that we should probably like also work together with Mark J, our uh, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice um, and, and, and think about this strategically, yes. Uh, I'm looking at it now, I mean, and, and, um, and they're still advertising. Uh, I mean, their advertisement says 600,000 come home from prison every year. With a job and support, they have a chance to succeed. CEO provides scalable solutions. Seems pretty, you know, attractive. 
like I'm I'm gonna assume if especially if I'm you know coming home and you know in desperate need of a job. And then I think uh, Chair Ayala, I just got a message from those from our council staff that we need to check into whether city council give funding to CEO. If that is the case, we have to uh, you know call them in like. What are you doing? Why are you referring people um, to these type of employment? So we definitely will take a look at that. Uh, Council member, um, Nilvia Coyote from Ninth has her hand raised as well. She may want to add to this discussion. Mm -hmm. Nilvia? Thank you so much. Uh, yes, we wanted to add that um, we also have several more, ca several more cases from uh, for this agency, Commissioner Salas. We have all their information, we have uh, photos of the receipts and other contracts from this dynamic safety uh, training school. And we also are aware about the CEO, how it, it's running and it's, it's really a humongous case. Um, but we would like to share that and that uh, we can share with you uh, all this information because we have been tracking the cases like Freddie uh, for this specific place. And that NICE obviously is mainly working with undocumented workers, providing training and other workforce um, development uh, services, because this is a community that is also very much affected by all these inequities in the construction industry. Yeah. Absolutely, we'll, we'll, we'll take you up on that offer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, if we've inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and is yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function at this time and you will be called on in the order that your hand was raised. Seeing no hands raised, I will turn it over to Chair Ayala to offer closing remarks. Chair? Yeah, um, so I'll be brief. I just really wanted to just say thank you um, to all of you for coming. And we really look forward to working collaboratively to finding um, a solution to this together um, and ending this, these exploitive uh, practices uh, throughout the city. Um, and with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>